Okay, let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your word. Thank you for the wisdom that you give us. Thank you for our fellowship and the ways that you lead us and you guide us into all truth. We ask that you would hover over us now as we go into the word and help us to understand it, to hear it, to receive it, and to act on it. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen. We have been doing a series on kingdom war. We've talked about different ways that the adversary shows up, how we recognize him, and last week we spent some time looking at how Yeshua confronted the adversary. These are the things we need to do. But this is a little different today. This is a weapon that is not in the list in Ephesians 6, but it is a weapon. It's a really, really important one. So we're going to talk about fasting, which is a spiritual weapon. We're going to start with Matthew 3, and it's 13 to 17. It says, Then Yeshua came from the Galilee to the Jordan to be immersed by Yochanan. But Yochanan tried to stop him. You're coming to me? I ought to be immersed by you. However, Yeshua answered him, Let it be this way now, because we should do everything righteousness requires. Then Yochanan let him. As soon as Yeshua had been immersed, he came up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. He saw the Spirit of God coming down upon him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. I am well pleased with him. Well, Yeshua had said, I have to do everything that righteousness requires. So what is that? Let's look at Matthew 4. This is 1 to 3. Then the Spirit led Yeshua up into the wilderness to be tempted by the adversary. After Yeshua had fasted 40 days and nights, he was hungry. The tempter came and said to him, If you're the Son of God, order these stones to become bread. Well, you know, he went through quite a trial those 40 days, and the adversary kept coming at him. And with each encounter, there was a battle of the words from the scripture. But he won the battle, and the enemy left him. And then it says, from that time on, Yeshua began proclaiming, turn from your sins to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You see, he first made a public confession of his commitment to the Father's will. That was what that baptism was, the immersion in the Jordan River. He fulfilled what is required for righteousness. Then he did battle against the enemy. This is something we have to do. It's part of our righteousness. Then we look at Matthew 4, 23 to 24. What happens after he's done all these things? <clears throat> it says, Yeshua went all over the Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing people from every kind of disease and sickness. Word of him spread throughout all Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill, suffering from various diseases and pains, and those held in the power of demons, and epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. So is it possible that we, in order to see these kinds of results of praying for people, have to do these works of righteousness that Yeshua did. He says in John fourteen twelve, Yes, 
Indeed, I tell you that whoever trusts in me will also do the works I do. Indeed, he will do greater ones because I'm going to the Father. Mark 16, 17 and 18 says, and these signs will accompany those who do trust. In my name, they will drive out demons, speak with new tongues, not be injured if they handle snakes or drink poison, and heal the sick by laying hands on them. These are the signs that are supposed to follow us if we believe. So are they following us? Is there something we're missing in our righteousness? And this is why these things aren't happening. So how did Yeshua do it? Let's look again. He had a mikvah, an immersion, to fulfill what righteousness required. He submitted himself to God's will. He prayed and he fasted. He confronted the adversary with the spoken word of God. Now, if we are expected to do these things, and even greater, then we want God's results. But we have to do it God's way. That's the only way we're going to get God's results. Let's look at Matthew 5. This is the famous Sermon on the Mount. Verse 1 and 2. It says, Seeing the crowds, Yeshua walked up the hill. After he sat down, his Talmudin, that's the disciples, came to him, and he began to speak, and this is what he taught them. Well, he taught them a whole lot of different things, and I've just chosen this one particular part, Matthew 6, 16 to 18. When you fast, don't go around looking miserable like the hypocrites. They make sour faces so that people know they're fasting. Yes, I tell you, they have their reward already. But you, when you fast, wash your face and groom yourself so that no one will know you are fasting except your Father, who is with you in secret. Your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So the question is, when we're fasting, do we grumble and complain about it? Or maybe we're not fasting at all. Maybe that's the issue. But there are some issues we need to look at concerning fasting. It's connected to mourning. It's not connected to being joyful and delighted. It's connected to mourning. We look at Matthew 9, 14 to 15. Then John's disciples came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Yeshua said to them, The guests of the bridegroom cannot mourn while the bridegroom is with them. Can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So he's essentially saying, when you feel my presence, when I'm with you, fasting really isn't necessary. But maybe you're feeling like I'm not with you. This is the time to fast. We look at Acts 13, 1 to 3. This is about the disciples, and we'll see that they fasted and prayed. But this was after Yeshua had already risen and gone up and ascended to the Father. It says, now in the Antioch community, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manani, and Saul. While they were serving the Lord and fasting, notice serving the Lord and fasting, the Ruach HaKodesh said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting, Praying and laying hands on them, they sent them off. We look at Acts 14, 23. It says, when they had handpicked elders for them in every community and prayed with fasting, they placed them in the care of the Lord in whom they had put their trust. So we see that the disciples did fast and they did pray. And it looks like 
they were doing that before they made these major decisions of who was going to be sent out on the missions. So they didn't do that without seeking God first. We look at Judges 20, and this is 25 to 27. This is about seeking God through fasting. But Binyamin went out against them and slaughtered the army of Israel. 18,000 men, armed with swords, fell. And then the whole army of Israel, all the people, went up to Batel and cried and sat there in the presence of Adonai. They fasted that day until evening, offered burnt offerings and peace offerings to Adonai, and asked God what to do. You see, this is a connection, fasting and seeking some advice, seeking some guidance. Fasting is a part of that. We look at a situation of corporate fasting when everybody was called together. This is in 1 Samuel 7, 5 to 7. Shmuel said, gather all Israel to Mitzpah, and I will pray for you to Adonai. So they gathered together at Mitzpah, drew water, and poured it out before Adonai, fasted that day, and said, we have sinned against Adonai. Shmuel began serving as judge over the people of Israel at Mitzpah. So what is this one related to? This is corporate fasting, when the group decided to come together and repent of sins in their group. And it was with fasting. We see that every year on the Hebrew calendar with Yom Kippur, coming together as a group to confess and repent. Then there's also the individual fasting. Second Samuel 1, 11 to 12. Then David took hold of his clothes and tore them, and so did all the men that were with them. And they mourned, wept, and fasted until evening for Saul and his son Jonathan, for the troops of Adonai and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. So this is connected with mourning, weeping, and fasting. Now there's also a time to fast when you're trying to persuade God in your favor. <laughs> we look at 2 Samuel 12, 15 to 18. This is the story of David and Bathsheba. And if you remember, he had an affair with Bathsheba. And in the process, he found out that she was now pregnant and he decided, I'd better just murder her husband. So he had him murdered. So this is where that story continues. He now has the child. Adonai struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and it became very ill. David prayed to God on behalf of the child. David fasted and then came and lay all night on the ground. The court officials got up and stood next to him, trying to get him off the ground, but he refused, and he wouldn't eat food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. So I'm seeing from that passage that David fasted for seven days. He was not going to get up from that floor. He was not going to eat with anyone. He was pleading with God for mercy. He knew he had done wrong and he was pleading for God, for the life of his child. So how did it end? Well, we look at 12, 20 to 23. It says, then David got up off the ground, washed, anointed himself, and changed his clothes. He went into the house of Adonai and worshiped. So he had been fasting seven days. His son was not revived. So after he finished the fast and ended it, he worshiped God, thanked him for his decision. So it goes on. Then he went to his own palace, and when he asked for food, they served it to him, and he ate. His servants asked him, what are you doing? You fasted and wept for the child while it was alive. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat food? 
You see, they were thinking, wait a minute, isn't fasting associated with mourning? And he answered them, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, because I thought maybe Adonai will show his grace to me and let the child live. But now that he's dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? No. So you see, when the reason for fasting was over, when the urgent need was over, the fasting ended. We look at 1 Kings 21, this is 25 to 29. This is a, an example where fasting did change God's mind. It says, Surely there was none like Ahab who sold himself over to do evil in Adonai's eyes at the instigation of Jezebel, his wife. He did grossly loathsome acts in following idols. Now, when Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his body, fasted, lay in sackcloth, and watched, walked about subdued. Sackcloth is like a very itchy potato sack. When people dress themselves in sackcloth, they are torturing themselves with itchiness. It's a way to repent. It's a way to say, man, I really blew it. I need to take some consequences for this. So here he is laying in his sackcloth. It says, then the word of Adonai came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Now, remember, Ahab, he just described him, grossly loathsome acts in following idols. This is the way God thought about him. This man is disgusting. And yet, it says that God spoke to him, to Elijah, and said, hey, did you notice that? Did you see that he humbled himself before me? And he goes on and says, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days, I will bring the evil upon his house. So he didn't get rid of the consequences, he delayed them. Enough for Ahab to experience a possibility of reconciling a relationship with God. And that was through fasting. We look at Esther 3. Now we know the story of Esther. She is the queen of Persia. And there is a plan in place from someone working for the king, somebody high up who's decided he wants to get rid of all the Jews. Esther is a Jew. She's got a problem. So let's see what happens. Esther 3.13. Dispatches were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces, stating to destroy, slay, and annihilate all the Jews, from the youth to the elderly, both little children and women, on a single day. Well, Esther hears that plot, and she's saying, now what can I do? What am I going to do? The Jews are going to be annihilated, and I'm one of the Jews. So let's look at Esther 4.3. In each and every province where the king's edict and law came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many put on sackcloth and ashes. So who responded to this? The Jews. Who was threatened by this? The Jews. They were the ones who decided, we need to fast, we need to wail, we need to weep, we need to reach God somehow. So Esther 4 says in verse 10 to 12, then Esther gave instructions for Mordecai, that was her uncle. All the king's servants and the people of king's provinces fully understand that for anyone, man or woman, who approaches the king in the inner courtyard without being summoned he has one law. He will be put to death unless the king extends his golden scepter, permitting him to live. But I have not been summoned to come to the king for 30 days. So she conveyed the message to Mordecai, her uncle. Now her uncle was trying to persuade her to go talk to the king. She said, no, you don't understand. I can't. That's 
that's a threat to my life. I can't just go talk to him. I have to wait for him to summon me. So, she's a good Jewish girl. She knows about fasting. So here's what happens. Esther 4, 15 to 16. Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Shushan and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast in the same way. Afterwards, I will go in to the king, even though it is not according to the law. So if I perish, I perish. So she knows that if she goes before the king, there is that possibility that she will be executed. And she says, please fast for me. And maybe in those three days of fasting, the king's heart will change and I will be able to present my case to protect the Jewish people. So Esther did end up getting an audience with the king and she was able to persuade him to equip the Jews and save them. So fasting changed everything for the Jewish people. And incidentally, those three days of fasting line up with the same three days that Yeshua was in the tomb and rose on the third day and had a victory for the Jewish people. And the same three days, Esther has this fast, and on the third day, she gains victory for the Jewish people. Here's another example of fasting. This is Daniel, the prophet, and he's seeking God with prayer and fasting. This time, he's going to go before God and seek his face for the nation. Just one individual going and pleading for the nation. Daniel 9, 3 to 6. So I set my face to the Lord to seek him by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to Adonai my God and confessed, saying, O oh Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and mercy with those who love him and keep his mitzvot, that's the commandments, we have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have acted wickedly. We have rebelled. We have turned away from your mitzvot and from your rulings. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our leaders, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. So what do we see in this example? We see a man who is a godly man. He's a prophet of God, and he's going before God with prayer and fasting, but not for his own sins, but for the sins of his nation. So have we ever thought about that, that we can go before God for the sins of our nation? That's what he says. So what happens for Daniel? He gets a really quick response. Daniel 9, 20 to 23. While I was still speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before Adonai my God on behalf of the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was praying, Gabriel, that's the big archangel, Gabriel, the one I had seen in an earlier vision, came to me swiftly about the time of the evening offering. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your request, a message went out. Not a while, but at the beginning of your request, the moment you sought God with prayer and fasting, there was a request. A message went out. So I have come to deliver the message to you, and you are greatly esteemed. Can you imagine, this is something we don't see. We don't see angels, not too many of us do, but yet they respond to our prayers of fasting and seeking God. They show up, they do the things that they need to do to bring about your prayer request. So let's take a look at another one, Joel 2, 12 to 15. 
Yet even now, says Adonai, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and lamenting. Tear your heart, not your garments. Turn to Adonai your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in grace, and willing to change his mind about disaster. Did you catch that? He is willing to change his mind about disaster. Joel has just told everyone, you need to turn to him with your whole heart and fast, and he's willing to change his mind. This is in the same subject matter of fasting. He is willing to change his mind. So who knows? He may turn and change his mind and leave a blessing behind him. Blow the shofar in Zion, proclaim a holy fast, call for a solemn assembly. So I'm going to ask you, what is a holy fast and what is an unholy fast? It looks like there may be two different things. Can we have an only unholy fast? Yes. Yes. Let's look at this, Isaiah 58, 3 to 4. Why have you fasted, yet you did not see? Oh, I'm sorry, I should rephrase that. Why have we fasted, yet you did not see? This is people crying out to God. Why have we fasted? You didn't see. We've afflicted our souls. You took no notice. Okay, here's the answer. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Behold, you fast for strife and contention and to strike with a wicked fist. You should not fast as you do today to make your voice heard on high. Now, doesn't that sort of sound like what David did fasting after he had created a child through adultery? Hmm. He didn't get what he wanted. He was seeking for his own pleasure. So let's go on. Wrong motives. This is the problem. Outward behaviors. When we're just fasting for outward behaviors, but we're not paying attention to what's going on in our heart. Isaiah 58, 5. Is this the fast of chosen? A day for one to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a reed? and spread out sackcloth and ashes. So he's not impressed with the sackcloth. Sorry, <laughs> we don't need the sackcloth. He says, wait a minute, are you just gonna bow down your head? Is that what it's all about? Will you call this a fast and a day that's acceptable to Adonai? So we wanna find out what is acceptable. What is a holy fast? What is one that he's going to pay attention to? Isaiah 58, 6 to 7. Is not this the fast I choose? To release the bonds of wickedness, to untie the cords of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to tear off every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover him? and not hide yourself from your own flesh and blood. So what's he saying? He says, you know, when you're gonna fast, is your heart right? Are you taking care of people who have needs? Maybe when you don't eat a meal, give the meal to somebody else to eat. Share it, give it to someone else. Okay, so share your bread with the hungry. These are the things that should be happening. Instead of fasting, or I should say, in addition to fasting, we need to think about these other issues, okay? So, let's go on. Isaiah 58, 8 to 10. These are the rewards of fasting. He guarantees these rewards. So, if you need these rewards, remember that fasting gets them. It says, Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will spring up speedily. Is anybody needing a speedy healing? <laughs> okay, so it says, yeah, so it says, when we fast. When we fast, 
this is what's going to happen when we have the right heart. Your healing will spring up speedily. Your righteousness will go before you. The glory of Adonai as your rear guard. And watch this promise. And then, after you've fasted with the right attitude, then you will call and Adonai will answer. You will cry and he will say, here I am. That's a great response, guys, when we pray. Here I am. I like that one. And he goes on. Here's more of the promise. If you get rid of the yoke among you, finger pointing and bad mouthing, if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will be like the midday. That's a big change. Big change. So let's go on and see some more promises. This is verse 8 to 10. Then Adonai will guide you continually. I like that promise. Satisfy your soul in drought. I like that promise. Strengthen your bones. I like that promise. That's a good one. I especially need that at my age. <laughs> Strengthen your bones. You will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Some of you will rebuild the ancient ruins, will raise up the age-old foundations, and will be called repairer of the breach, restorer of streets for dwelling. So you've heard the word, you can't get away from it. <laughs> you heard it, you're responsible for it. What we hear, we better do, right? We've been hearing about fasting. We started with Yeshua as our example, right? And the first thing he did before he entered his public ministry was to be immersed and fast and pray. And while he was fasting and praying, he encountered the enemy and he fought him with the words of the scriptures. That was our example. And he won every battle. And then he said, now, I'm going to go to the Father, and you are going to do greater works than me. Well, how do we do the greater works if we don't follow what he did? That's his example, right? So we have to do it. So we look at James 1, 21 to 25. So rid yourselves of all vulgarity and obvious evil. Receive meekly the word implanted in you that can save your lives. Don't deceive yourselves by only hearing what the word says, but do it. If a person looks closely into the perfect Torah, which gives freedom and continues becoming not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word it requires, then he will be blessed in what he does. So what do we have to do with this verse? We just heard it. What do we have to do? We have to do it. Otherwise, we don't get that last part of the sentence. Then he will be blessed in what he does. So what's the if statement? If you hear the word, then you do it. And then you will be blessed in what you do. It's a good promise. So, what's this fasting all about? First of all, we looked at the benefits. It's in Isaiah 58. That's our great big chapter for fasting. We have great benefits. We go to God for confession and fasting, repentance. We go to him to seek advice. We go to him when we're mourning. These are the times when we fast. When we really, really, really need an answer when we really need our health coming back speedily, when we really need strong bones. <laughs> These are all the reasons that we do this. But for Israel, there's another reason. We are in the month of Tisha B'Av, I mean, in the month of Av, and we are coming next week to the ninth of Av, which is Tisha B'Av, okay? On the ninth of Av, Israel had catastrophes and more catastrophes. 
So here's a few of them. The first temple was completely burned to the ground in 586 BCE, and they were exiled to Babylon. They lost their nation. They lost, they lost everything. They lost their houses. They lost everything they had, and on to Babylon. But the temple was a major destruction in their lives. This is the center of life. If you're going to be following the Torah, you've got to go to the temple to bring your sacrifices. You go to the temple for all of the pilgrimage feasts. What are you going to do when there's no temple? Their life was utterly, utterly in shambles. So, if they didn't learn their lesson the first time, <laughs> they got to come back. They got to rebuild Jerusalem. They got to rebuild their land. And then, on the exact same day, the 9th of Av, in 70 AD, they had another destruction of the second temple. The same day, the exact same day. Why? What's going on with this day? Then they had the defeat in the Bar Kokhba revolt. This was a revolt against the Roman rulers in Jerusalem who were oppressing the Jewish people. So they revolted, they got massacred. They suffered their defeat, they surrendered on, guess what, the 9th of Av. Then when there were evictions of the Jews from England in 1290, they were evicted on the 9th of Av. In Spain in, 19, in 1492, when Columbus was leaving, they had the Spanish Inquisition going on. The queen and the king said, all the Jews have to exit this place. Everybody has to be gone by July 31st, 1492. That was the 9th of Av. So what's going on with this? What is the 9th of Av about? Well, we're going to talk about that next Sunday because it's the 9th of Av. <laughs> And it is a fast day for the, for the Jewish people all around the world. They are seeking God's face because they know that calamities have struck over and over and over again on the 9th of Av. So this is a proactive measure, preventative. Let's see if we can win God's favor and get his protection. Now I heard over the last couple of days starting from the beginning of the month of Av, they've had almost 200 missiles that were fired at Israel from the Gaza Strip. Hamas is after them. And they started on the first of Av. No accidents here. Maybe they don't know the Hebrew calendar, but they follow the adversary. And the adversary knows the, cal the calendar. So we are going to be in corporate fasting with them on this coming Sunday. And then on Sunday at 4.30 when we meet, I will explain to you why all these catastrophes happened on the 9th of Av. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your word and the wisdom and the guidance and the teaching. The stories tell us so many things. We just have to dig for our buried treasure, and it's there. It's always there. We ask for protection for the Jewish people around the world, but specifically in Israel right now. People are running to the bomb shelters. Kids can't play in the streets. Kids' camps are being canceled. Special outings are being canceled. Their whole lives are being disrupted because missiles are being fired. And we thank you that you've protected them this far. No lives have been lost. But I can't imagine what it's like to live like that. I ask that you would give them an extreme amount of peace. Let them really feel your presence in the midst of the chaos. And let them see the glory of the Lord and the hand of the Almighty come to protect them. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.